Okay, we're recording now. Just so you know, does it does it tell you it's recording like right above my right above your head there? Yeah, good. Just so you know, because you know, always being recorded, that's a big deal. It's not like I'm the NSA or something like that. Holy smokes, we, we can talk about, you know, a big topic in this class is going to be data privacy. So there we go. It's awesome. Um, all right, we have one more person that's trying to come in. Oh, Lissa. Very good. Lissa, if you can join, that would be great tonight, as long as you can. Um, Lissa is joining us from probably Kuwait, if that's where she's at at this point in the world. In the dark. <laughs> in the dark in Kuwait, yeah. The oil has run out, as officially, as of tonight. <laughs> He's not going to like this, joking about her. <laughs> okay, so let's just say hi real fast, then I'll give the link to the agenda and we'll get rolling. So I'm just <laughs> professor for the class. All right, Wendy, let's turn to you. Um, uh, let's see if I can remember what I was supposed to say. I'm Wendy Rice. Um, I live in Alexandria, Virginia, and... Um, this is my, hopefully, my last class before I get my master's in library science. And I'm really looking forward to being done. Um, we have four kids, and I teach fifth grade during the day. So I'm, like, excited to be taking this. Um, Dr. Cahill said it was a good class and recommended it. Did I forget something I was supposed to say? Nope, that is good. That's, that's okay. what I started to want to know, where everyone's at in the world tonight. <clears throat> All right, awesome. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, Mike Harden. Uh, I'm right here in Lexington. I'm actually just right down the road from the keep there where Dr. Justin is. This is the and, keep. Uh, the keep. Uh, I'm an instructor at the Bluegrass Community and Technical College uh, over on Newtown Road right here in town. And uh, I'll be finishing up this spring, too, for the master's program. So we'll see what the future holds. Yeah, I know. All it's so much has happened so fast. I've been here so long nowadays. I feel like an old timer, but I'm here when all you guys started. So it's so cool to watch someone like Mike get started and then move all the way through and now finishing up and thinking about next steps. All cool stuff. All yeah, right, it's Bobby. weird. You, you recruited me, so <laughs> yeah, long time ago, far, far away. Actually, no, exactly right here in this seat. But whatever, <laughs> Bobby, your turn. Okay, I'm Bobby Parsons, and I'm in Hardin County. I've taught elementary school for 23 years, and I'm working on a specialist degree. Mm -hmm. That's about Very it. Cool. And for Hardin County, for those that are not in Kentucky, it's sort of in the exact geographic center of Kentucky. There's a little town called Elizabethtown. Do you live in Elizabethtown? Yeah. And there was an old, there was a movie made about Elizabethtown, Kentucky about 10 years ago. It starred Orlando Bloom. Remember this movie? Yeah. Yes. Anyway, if you want to know much more about Elizabethtown, Kentucky. Although it was probably all filmed in Hollywood. You know how that goes. <clears throat> okay, on Tanya. Hi everyone, my name is Tanya Fields. Um, I'm in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Um, I work at Western Kentucky University, this is my office. Um, and I am a second semester um, doc student. Um, educational Leadership Studies is um, EDD I'm pursuing. Oh, and I'm, I'm an assistant director of distance learning here at WKU. Um, and this is, I think this aligns with a lot of the um, content that I'm used to and that I'm familiar with and that I'm interested in. So that's uh, why I picked it up as my specialization elective. Yep, that's awesome. Uh, historically, we've always had a mix of P12 and uh, higher ed in here. And so this is yeah. very normal for us in UKSTL. And so uh, we'll cover uh, some of both spaces. Great. You know, I'll default to K12 because I'm a K12 guy, P12 guy. Um, but we'll cover some of both spaces and one of your <clears throat> One of the three major debates in this class is a higher education debate. So. Okay. Good. All right, Ashley. Hi, I'm Ashley Rosen. I am here in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, I am the computer apps teacher and tech coordinator at Wimburn Middle School. And I am in my last semester of the specialist in uh, teacher leadership with school technology emphasis. So uh, I'm doing a lot with some of the stuff we've learned in class. So I'm excited to see where things wrap up and where I'm headed next. So, yeah, cool. We'll have fun. This is the last one for you as well. So, wow, we're catching the last class for some folks. That's sort of nice. Uh, Lissa, if you, if your audio works, we're not seeing your video, Lissa, but um, I think we're getting your audio. So go ahead and say hi. Uh, hi. 
Can you, does the audio work? Yes, audio yeah. is good, Lisa. Okay, cool. Um, my video is black because I'm really tired and I don't want to turn the lights on. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm in Kuwait and I'm at the American International School here. I'm a K-12 technology integration coach and this is also with Mike, my last semester of the MED. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And like Mike, I'm sure we're probably talking about whether or not a next step makes sense. So it's cool. All right. So here we are. For some of you, the last class. This is EDL 665. This is the meant to be the last course in the UKSTL sequence. Um, it doesn't always wind up that way. So if you're, if you're like Bobby, it's probably in the middle of your sequence somewhere. So it's perfectly fine. Um, but this is sort of going back big picture. We sort of start big picture with 661. And then in this class, we, we go back to big picture. And this class is pretty focused on the for real of trying to do a lot of this stuff. Um, and how to get it done in policy and how to build structural change over time uh, with a bit of a focus on law simply because that's where I get to, to live my life and spend my time. So over in the chat, if you guys have not clicked in already, go ahead and click over to the chat and you'll see I put a link to the agenda in there. And I'll be posting links in the chat as we go along tonight. But most of the links that we'll use tonight are living in our little agenda document. So we'll just work from this. And you can see already, it's not super long. And uh, tonight I'll probably do a little bit of lecture because we don't have our full class here tonight. And, um, and I wanna get some big picture concepts and, and do some things that make sense for recording purposes uh, so that people can wind up watching this. Uh, if you're sort of new, this is gonna be a rather large class. I think we have uh, last count about 16 students in the class, uh, which is good and fun. And uh, so, a lot of them are missing tonight, but our next meeting, I'm sure our little window here is going to be full of many more little blocks with video in it. And we'll, we'll push Zoom and see how far it can hold. And because Tanya is who she is, this will be a good test for you. Have you messed with Zoom at all before, Tanya? No, so new. No, I have not. So I'm excited to see what, um, I'm going to actually ask the instructional designers tomorrow if they've heard of it, because um, we use Connect here, so. Do you? Yeah. I'm just frustrated with Connect. Has it been giving you issues at all at Western? Uh, not that I'm aware of. No. Okay. I've gotten frustrated with it. We've called Adobe at UK several times, and Adobe's statement is like, we don't really support Connect that much anymore, and, you know, like, we don't really want to solve your problems. <laughs> so, Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Adobe's making money on so many different ways that Connect is just a small little side project for them. But Okay, so as you can see, first thing, I should tell you a little bit about myself and why it's relevant to this class. Let's start with the fun stuff. So you can uh, meet Lucille there in the Flickr link. If you follow the Flickr link, that's little Lucy. She was born about, she was born about 10 days ago, something like that. Yay! Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Lisa. It's, uh, it's been awesome this time, I'll say, because uh, our first kids, and you can see there in the agenda link, the rest of my family, I have four kids now. Um, the, the oldest one there, he was, he was five pounds when he was born and had to spend a few days in the NICU. Um, and uh, the twins, those, the other two there, the orange shirt and the purple shirt, are twins. And uh, they were born at about three pounds in some ounces and we spent like five weeks in the NICU which was very difficult so our whole experience has been NICU based <laughs> so this time the, the kid weighed eight pounds and um, they just gave her to us right at birth and they're like here you take care of her and I was like what is this aren't we supposed to like go and put her in an incubator and no none of that stuff happened so it's been really awesome this time uh, she's eight pounds and she's already gaining weight back again. So, um, I don't know, it's been awesome. So, it's good, I guess. She totally looks like you. <laughs> <laughs> you think so? That one little shot is my hand there. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, everyone is talking about, you know, the ch fat chubby cheeks. Like, yeah, great, that's what I really want for my kids. <laughs> <laughs> yep. 
So, and she apparently has the, the Bathin's nose. So anyway, whatever. Looks change, you know, quite a bit. So this kid might wind up looking like entirely like my wife uh, when it's all said and done. But yeah, she definitely sort of looks like a Bathin at the moment. So, yep, that's it. It's been an awesome 10 days. And I'll get to go home after class tonight. I'll go home and I'll take my shift on the evening shift. She, uh, she started off really bad with nights, but we've switched now to where she, she is sleeping some at night. So it's, uh, it's getting better. So Mike says I look pretty well rested. So I've had a long day. I've been at work all day. I actually was at steam all day long. Now I'm over here. So uh, thanks. I don't know if I feel like it, but I have been like cranking through the coffee over the last two hours. So could be that. <laughs> could be a crash coming soon. All right, about a bit about myself relevant to this class. So first off, um, I am an attorney, which is weird, I guess. I don't know how I feel about that, or it's always weird to introduce myself that way. Um, but uh, so I, I teach a lot of law courses and I spend some time working in law and I spend a lot of time um, dealing with law. I host the law and education conference here in Kentucky. It's coming up in a couple of months and uh, or one month, I guess. And um, I also spent some time working in education policy. So I, I, I'm from Illinois. I, I worked for the Illinois State Board of Education training special education hearing officers for a little while. And then I worked for the Education Commission of the States for a little while um, as well. So both some time working at the, like the state board level and then some time working in education policy all before I decided that, you know, like some of you in the room, that a doctorate, another doctorate made sense for me because the law degree is number one. So anyway, so yes, I know quite a bit about the law and I, I'm really into law and technology and schools. Right, and so that's what we're going to look at tonight, which is law and tech and schools. That space is is really unique. It's really popping. A lot of things are happening in that space, and uh, I definitely try to consider myself. I should be doing a better job, but I do consider myself one of the world's leading experts in that area. So there you go. So for me, this is absolutely the course that is the tightest fit to what I do. So if like if I were to build a course that was like exactly what I do in my life. It would be EL 665, this course. So I love this course. On the other hand, because it's like so, so personal to me, and, and it's, I feel like I struggle to teach it a little bit, so please stop me, because there's frequently times when I'll just assume, I'll assume something, and um, that, that's a bad assumption. You know, so like I deal with this kind of stuff all day long, all the time, and so, um, you know, frequently I'll just talk about something and no one will know what I'm talking about. So <laughs> that could happen in here. In fact, it's likely, especially since we have some higher educators in here. Um, so please don't feel afraid to just stop me. It, it is a course that's going to talk some about law. Um, and we're going we're gonna to find out here in a few minutes that I bet most of you don't have that much experience with law. And so... Uh, that scares some people. I, it shouldn't scare you, but uh, it is certainly a subject that is different and new for a lot of folks. So we'll find out in a minute more about that. Um, the other thing I should tell you is that um, I don't know what I should tell you. I don't even care. You can ask me whatever you want. Um, I have two different colored eyes, like weird things like that. It's fine. But uh, I'm also now a days sort of opening a new high school here in Lexington. Um, it's called the STEAM Academy, and uh, we are, uh, we're, I'm opening it with uh, Ashley's, was Tina ever your principal, Ashley, at Wimburn? Yes, she was my principal for six years. Yeah, so I'm sort of co-directing in some ways, opening a new high school here in Lexington, which we're going to build on UK's campus, which is really exciting. Uh, so... Right now, you get, you're you getting a dose of me that is super real and practical because that is what's going on in my life right now. Like, I'm dealing with these exact same issues every day in classrooms. In fact, I taught the whole month of January. I was teaching uh, citizenship to high school freshmen all month long. And so um, I just came out of the K-12 classroom, now back into the higher ed classroom. So uh, 
I'm in a weird place in my life at the moment, so sorry in advance, I guess. I'm sure I'll talk a lot about Steam. I apologize. But yeah. So, okay. Any other questions? So here's what we're going to do to introduce ourselves. And so I'm going to set it all up and I'll give you a couple minutes to play. Little ESPN update coming in. Is it who's playing tonight? <laughs> Don't worry about it. It's fine. So uh, here's what we're going to do to introduce ourselves. I, I ran this thing um, about two months ago with a group of educators that worked really well. And so um, most of you are in this class for pretty much everyone in the room right now. Um, ex with the exception of like Wendy. Okay. No, I guess not most. Uh, and Tanya. <sighs> A lot of the folks in this space that'll be in class with you, Wendy and Tanya, sort of think of themselves as technology leaders. Uh, that's a weird title. We don't know what that means. It evolves. Uh, I've been in this space of technology leadership now for over a decade, and it certainly means something different today than it meant 10 years ago. Uh, so because there's so many different people working in this space, all of which can, can legitimately call themselves tech leaders, what I want to do is this little activity. So do you see the little, what do you do at the bottom of page one of the agenda? If you click into that, you should be able to go in and edit a shared Google slide deck. Um, inside that Google slide deck, I can probably share my screen for just a second to show you. Uh, inside that Google slide deck, share screen with computer center, we'll just share screen only. So inside of that, you guys are seeing the slide deck, right? Thumbs up if so. Right up. Um, you can see it's just this. You remember these things of, you know, what does my mom think I do? You remember this little internet meme that happened about a year ago or so? This little, little thing went around. So I, I thought that was cool and cute. And I think it is a really great way to introduce people to one another. So, especially because we all sort of think of ourselves as technology leaders, you know, so what we think we are, who we think we are, what we think we do. That's what I'd like to know more about. So um, the concept here is I built out like 20 slides that we can build into. And so everyone just pick a different slide, put your name at the top where it says name, and then go and find images that represent the questions uh, that are there. So you can see on mine, uh, here, I what my friends think I do, you know, they think I'm a professor. Professors like sleep and sit around all day and do nothing at all. So I, I think that's what my friends think. I have no idea. Um, my mom still thinks I'm like a, just a teacher. Like she still hasn't really made the break from me being a K-12 high school teacher a long time ago. Still sort of thinks that's what I've got going on. Um, student thinks, students think I do not answer email. So I'll apologize in advance. I'm not awesome at email. My boss thinks I write papers. I think I get to hang out with all of my uh, doctoral students and just hang out and have a good time. So in the UKSTL doc program, these are doc students there that we went up to the top of, um, what do we call that thing? Oh, I'm forgetting Natural Bridge here in Kentucky. And what I actually do is things like tonight. I teach online, talk to people all over the world on video. <laughs> That's how I spend a lot of my time. So, so I'm interested in, in what that is for all of you. I can see some people are already starting to pull some in. Oh, I love it. For whoever is pulling in a picture of Sheldon, well played. <laughs> so yeah, just pull those in, size them up, and sort of put in uh, what you, who you think you are, what you think you do. Go ahead and pull some. I'll give a couple of minutes just to get us started. And then for everyone that's not in the room tonight, I'll give this as a little homework assignment because there's a lot of us in the class, and so we'll all get well introduced to one another next time with this little, this little game, this little side, slide deck of what we actually do and what we think we do. And if anyone is having any tech challenges, just let me know. You can always type something into the chat. I watch the chat throughout class. You can always just, inside the chat, you can also just send something just to me by clicking send to just me. And um, just let me know if there's any issues. But I see people are starting to pull things in. That's good. Mm 
Justin, our other class is starting. Can I fill in on this later, or what should we do yeah. for that? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, okay. I'm going to have other people fill in. So okay. everyone's going to fill in by, before we meet next time. And I'm going to try to go back and forth if I can. But. <laughs> Good luck. All right, super. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. There we go. Pop back in. Okay. Yep, absolutely. It's fine. Chelsea, whoever else needs to pop out for a second or for the class. So all fine with me. Oh, nice. Wow, Mike, you are all into this. Like, you were born for this activity, Mike. I have certain skills. <laughs> Okay, so you can keep playing with that if you want. I'm going to talk a little bit about the course and uh, just the syllabus, and it's there. I'll get it all up in here into the recording so people can sort of see it in the recording. Um, so I put a link to the course syllabi there in the, in the chat. I think I still have uh, all but one person, I think, has managed to access Canvas and the syllabus without much issue, so I think I'm still just working through one person. Is that you, Wendy? Turn your mic on at the bottom there. It's okay. Uh, I did get into Canvas. Okay, good. Maybe someone yeah. else. I'm still tracking down one. I did, yeah, but I did have trouble at first. Oh, okay. Very good. I, just, I don't know what I was But doing, you made but it. I think That's excellent. All right, super. So inside of Canvas is a link to the syllabus. It's not too complex, so we'll take a, just a second to have a look. There's a bunch of legal ease in here. No kidding. So... Once you start to see the law, you see it everywhere. But here it is in the syllabus popping up, saying all the things that we are legally compliant with. Uh, as I said in the emails that went out earlier, um, we're going to do we're going to rock on two books in this class, as well as some articles and videos. Um, the I know both of the authors, and um, both of the books I like, and both of them have major limitations. Like I said, like this is the course that most tightly fits me. So, like, my opinion on what a book should be in this space is pretty, I have my own thoughts, my own very clear thoughts on that, and eventually I should probably write the book in this space, but I have not done it yet. So we're going to rely on Nancy and Chris to get us through with their two books, and we'll put them together. So Nancy's book is more legal in nature. And it's also more focused on safety issues, digital safety issues, which is, of course, a huge concern um, around schools. Nancy, um, this book in 2012 represented a big change for Nancy. Nancy had been a pretty anti-tech person uh, throughout the, the aughts, whatever, the decade from 2000 to 2010. Um, as tech really started to hit schools, Nancy was very, very adamant about bullying and cyberbullying and really trying to keep create separate spaces. But in 2012, Nancy, what I like about this book, and I like that she uses the word embracing in the title, because it very much represents an embracing for her personally, but also represents a really, really art articulate and um, very intelligent, in my opinion, take on these issues of digital safety. There's a, there's a few pages in the book that I absolutely adore, so we'll definitely make sure to look at those. Um, when Nancy really looks at what's really going on with digital safety issues versus what is the perception of digital safety issues, which there's, there's a lot of concern, a lot of 
you know, news stories, but what's really happening. And Nancy does a good job of that over a course of a few pages. And then also does a nice job of just looking at these big issues, bullying and all that kind of stuff. So I like that one. Oh, they're both by Corwin from Thousand Oaks. Huh? I didn't even notice that until now. And then the other ones by Chris Wells, who is living now in, um, in I think Barcelona, no Valencia, Spain. I don't know. He was the, um, he was the sort of the chief information officer for one of the major districts in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, so in that role as uh, sort of the chief technologist for one of Atlanta's major districts, he uh, of course did a lot with policy. And so he took the time to, to write a book on policy and what, what he considered to be smart policy related to digital issues in schools. And so uh, we'll check out Chris's book as well. But after Chris wrote it, he's like, I'm out. Took off to Valencia <laughs> and has spent the last year and a half chilling in Valencia. I think he's working on another book, but um, he just wanted out. He just, he, he was overwhelmed. So I'm trying to work in one of those major, major Atlanta school districts. Like I, I think it was Duluth County, but I'm not positive which one it was. I'm sure it says on the book somewhere. Um, so I can only imagine how difficult that was. So he needed a little time away. And uh, I was just talking with one of the other UK professors who's going to take a sabbatical in Germany over the next year. And this whole concept of a year away starting to be intriguing to me. So unfortunately, I got to build a school first. But after I get the school built, I'm going to take a year away somewhere. I enjoyed my time in Malaysia, as Lisa would probably know. I really... I loved Singapore and Kuala Lumpur. Oh, I could see spending a whole year just hanging in Malaysia. That would be awesome. So, okay, those are the books. So uh, this class revolves a bit around the NETS A Standard 5. I'm sort of on page two of the syllabus if you're playing along at home. NETS A Standard 5, Digital Citizenship. This is the, the sort of the foundational standards underlying this course. Uh, for those that are new to this whole sequence of courses, uh, UKSTL, there's five um, standards inside the NETSA, and for our little sequence, we sort of take them standard by standard. So standard five is the last of those standards, and it deals with digital citizenship and all kinds of the issues around ethics and um, establishing policies, promoting um, responsible social interactions. <coughs> and cultural understandings, global issues, kinds of stuff. So we'll try and hit on all of those. And we'll focus a lot on policy and law, uh, just because there's a lot to do there. A lot of fun stuff. Questions so far? Righto. So class assignments. All right, so as I think I said in one of the emails, this class is a one major assignment kind of class. There's sort of two big things you gotta do in this class. One of them is individual and a big job. And then one of them, the other is group. And uh, it's not really a huge job. It just requires some group participation and working together. So uh, we have the, the first one that's listed there is the technology law court, number three under assignments. So I'm going to give you three scenarios. I'm going to talk about the first scenario tonight, and I'll give it to you before class next time. And then uh, we'll have like court here in class. And I've done it before in the digital space, and it worked pretty well. I've not done it with 16 or 18 or however many is in this class, but I think it'll be fine. So, um, you know, we're, we're talking some legal issues, some policy issues. So let's, let's have some court you know, it's a great way to really discuss and dive deeply into these issues. So I have three scenarios, three pretty detailed scenarios that's written like a law exam is written, but it's not an exam. Uh, but that's how, when you read them, you can think this is what law students have to deal with. Um, so it's written like that. And I'll split you up into three groups. One side represents the students. One side represents the school. One side represents the judges is the judges and then we rotate so that everyone gets a turn sort of in each of the different roles uh, the second one I think is a higher education based scenario or maybe the first one I don't know one of them is 
Um, and it looks at social media issues and a, an incident that actually occurred around social media um, from a university to the south of us. So uh, we'll check that out. Um, the, one, another one of them looks at, I think, uh, BYOD policies. Yeah, it does. And um, the very complex requirements around one-to-one -one devices, BYOD devices, all these devices that are coming pouring into schools. Like, what, what do we do legally in that space? Um, the, oh, no worries, Wendy. That's it. okay. Um, so that is another one. And then uh, I think we do one on search and seizure cell phones. Oh my gosh, searching these little devices has become a big problem in schools. Oh, you can read some of my texts there. Actually, sorry, I should turn those off. I don't know what people have been texting me. <laughs> so anyway, so those are some technology cases. You'll represent one party on each of those. And if you are representing the parties, then you have to submit a brief to the court and you have to do that one week after the case is argued, oral argument. So we'll have oral argument first here in class, in our little Zoom room. And then we will, one week after that, with your group, you'll submit your brief to the judges. I'll then forward that brief on to the judges. The judges then have a week after that to give their decision so that their decision is hitting the next time we're meeting. Okay, so that's this all whole thing, little times out, sort of. and what happens is you wind up writing three group papers, basically. Two group papers representing a party, and then one group paper sort of writing a case yourself as a judge. Uh, so it's not too hard. It's scary the first time just because you have to work with group members and this, these digital spaces and on a project that's probably unfamiliar to all of you, which is like submitting oral arguments, writing down case briefs, all new things for everyone. So it'll be scary the first time, but you'll see it's not too bad. So that's big assignment number one. Questions there? Okay, we're gonna do the first of those here pretty quickly. Then there'll be a little bit of a gap, like a month gap, and then we'll pick up the next two. So the first one sort of happens fast, because um, I try to align that with what we're talking about in class so that the so that whatever we're talking about in class is reinforced by the case. And so anyway, first one happens quickly. I'll send that out later pretty soon. And of course, the big assignment that I warned you about in email is the policy brief. So any of you written a policy brief before? Thumbs up if so, anyone? Lisa, I can't really see you, which is perfectly fine. Done a policy brief before? No, I haven't. Okay, so do you know these things? You've heard of these things, policy briefs. They're very popular. It's much of how law and policy gets made. Uh, you know, everyone wishes it was like all based on research articles and everyone's reading journals before they write up a new law or policy, but that's not how the world works. Uh, the world actually runs on these little policy briefs, so they get written all the time. These are the kinds of things that legislators read, especially legislative aides read these types of things as they're thinking about new laws to make or new policies to pass at a local district. These are the kinds of documents you would bring to a school board as you're considering a new policy to implement at the school level or a board of trustees if you happen to sit at the higher education side. Uh, and we hope all of you at, in your careers at some point will, will have the opportunity to change policy and so we are going to practice changing policy here in class. So the policy brief is on a topic that you actually want to change and with the concept being that you actually submit it. For those of you that are somewhat new to me, um, I like to be very practical. I'm a very, very practical guy. So uh, I like assignments to actually do things in the real world. So um, this is a, one of those assignments that I'd like to see you have in mind real implementation. So for instance, Tanya, who's sitting there at Western Kentucky in the higher education space, surely there is some distance learning policy that can be improved at Western Kentucky University. And so, boom, here is your opportunity. Let's do it. Let's do it for real. We'll, we'll do all of our homework. We'll write it all up into this really nice, tidy policy brief. And then you can submit it 
to whoever the heck it needs to be submitted to. And look, you've done all your homework. They read it. They see all the homework is done. And they're just like usually, okay, let's do it. What do you think we should write? So you might even actually include model policy language or model legislative language as part of this policy brief. Um, and so many new policies actually have been established as a result of EDL 665, and I expect this class to be no different. So uh, yeah, that's the one really big, somewhat scary assignment, but this is a real chance to change the world, and uh, let's do it. I'll help you. It will be fun. And I'm always, always surprised by the nuance that is used in these policies um, because so frequently the people that really know what should be changed and how to change it are folks like yourself, not folks sitting in state capitol buildings or sitting in Washington, D.C. or any of that kind of nonsense. They don't know what's going on on a daily basis. And folks that know what's going on on a daily basis usually write way more intelligent policy. It's just that they so infrequently do that. So we are going to try to speed that process up a little bit here in class. So uh, there's a big rubric in there. Uh, but don't don't be too worried about it. Um, it's just, but it is the big assignment. So I want you all, even now, and all of you watching at home on the vi on the recording, also to start thinking about what is a policy that you would be interested in changing for real. That is not too much. Like you don't want to be like we don't want to say something like I would like to change the no child left behind testing regime in the United States. Like that's too big, too big. It was real narrow substantially you know you gotta be something really really small so for instance maybe with using Tanya again at, at Western Kentucky University so one that we have here is the policy for online programs in other states I'm sure Tanya is aware that, that it's really complex right now about what uh, like we are offering so um, Wendy is sitting in Virginia Liz is sitting in Kuwait so here we are we at, in Kentucky are offering this online program all over the world uh, and other states, of course, are now starting to be like, hey, wait a second, Kentucky, stay out of our space and or get approval to be in our space first before you go offering online programs in our state. It's a really complex issue right now, which is hard for universities to deal with because they don't have, do you have like a legal team in your distance learning office there, Tanya? No, we do not. We only have one staff member and she has no legal expertise. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So this is a really complex legal question that uh, we, each university needs to develop their own policy on. So here's an opportunity, and that's, I just made that one up, Tanya, so don't feel any requirement to do anything on that front, but. No, it was one of my topics. <laughs> it was one you actually might've thought about, exactly. See? There you go. Yes, it's not my first rodeo. I can sort of predict these things. All right, so, um, so that's the big assignment for the class. Uh, as you scroll down, you can sort of see how the topics will break out over time and like how I roll for those of you that are new to me is we'll have class, we have activities in class as you see already, we're going to be active on Google Docs. We're going to be actively collaborating on things here in the classroom. But in between those times, it's sort of like when you do your homework and you watch online modules or you do the readings. So that all sort of sits in between these 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 times that we're together in the same space. And then uh, we sort of cover the material that we, we did up into that point. So that's sort of how we roll. Questions about any of that? I'm not too complicated of a teacher. The hardest part that people tell you about me, I'm sure Alyssa and Mike and Bobby, whoever else has had me, is sometimes I'm definitely slow. I, I'm running a zillion miles an hour trying to build new school buildings and all kinds of craziness like that. And so uh, you might have to, like Wendy's, had to send me a couple of emails to try to get the Canvas thing worked out. That, that's a little bit normal for me. I'm going to apologize in advance. I'm sure I'll pay the price in evals later. It's just how it rolls. So. Um, you know, Twitter is actually a great way to get a hold of me. I like Google Hangouts a lot. That's a great way. But, you know, people that really work closely with me use Google Hangouts a lot. Um, so you might try multiple mechanisms because I'm sure, like all of you, I get like 412 emails per day. So, uh, you know, as I'm trying to deal with various kid who did various stupid thing, like bring joints to school, which happened a couple of days ago over at Steam Academy, you know, it's, the emails keep rolling in as that kind of stuff happens. and so. 
things get lost in my head. So you might just try multiple approaches. So I, I do love Twitter and I love Google Hangouts. Um, uh, I, I gave you my cell phone number in the, in the, um, in the syllabus. No, I did not actually. This is a uh, copy of this from an old one. So here, I'll put my cell phone number in the chat. I'll also give it an email. It's perfectly fine. Just text me, call me. It's all cool. I deal with the phone pretty easily. What kind of what kind of phone do you have? I have an iPhone five. It's old. Okay. This one cool. fell in the river. Actually, it's amazing. The whole little put it in rice for three days thing. Yeah, that is true. It works. Yeah, proven right here. This little guy. <laughs> I was in the Kaskaskia River, which is a which is a small river in Illinois. I was boating with my dad. We were catfishing in the middle of the night, and the boat got away from my dad. And um, I was holding it onto the bank, and it pulled me out into the river. And he had the motor running, and I then went under the boat. I thought, oh my, this might be the end. But I grabbed onto the side, and he got the motor shut off real fast. So <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I got an iPhone 5, so you can text me. You can do the iMessage thing, too. I can, yeah, I can do iMessages. I was iMessaging with Professor Wayne Lewis right before class. Um, some of you had Professor Lewis up to this point. He is our doctoral program chair, so like Tanya, has to deal with Dr. Lewis all the time. And since we are in a class that deals with education policy, Dr. Lewis was in the newspaper just today, just this afternoon, as he finds himself from time to time. I love it. Uh, let's see, chronic drinking, here it is, plan for charters. So here's the link over in the chat. Uh, Dr. Lewis found himself in the news again because he was testifying in the legislature about charters here in Kentucky. So it's a big debate that's been going on in Kentucky for a little while now. And uh, I don't know if we're going to do it or not, but every single year Wayne testifies to the legislature and every single year there's a newspaper story written and every single year the, the bill dies in committee. So we'll see if this year is any different. <laughs> but uh, we do real policy here in the department. So that's uh, it's something that we take pride in that we've worked on quite a bit. And uh, so, you know, ask any kinds of questions you have about this kind of stuff. I'll be up at the legislature in about two weeks. We have a bill that I'm helping to make happen here in Kentucky on um, student voice in schools and adding students to superintendent search committees. And so that bill is gonna have a hearing at the legislature uh, in about two weeks. So I'll be up in Frankfurt at that one. They asked me if I wanted to testify. I was like, absolutely not, no. I never wanna talk to you all. Just, I wanna be in the back of the room. I want no one to really know who I am. That's the best case. <laughs> I definitely don't want to be in the newspaper on this topic. So anyway, so maybe as that bill progresses, we'll come back to the student voice bill and see how that goes in the legislature this year. I think we'll get it passed, but I'm not positive. You know, it's, a, it's an off year for us here in Kentucky, so we'll see what they get done. All right, I am a little bit off tax. Let's get back to the agenda then. Uh, the only other thing I should mention is Canvas is important in this class. So it's basically where everything's gonna be between Canvas and Zoom, that's gonna pretty much be our digital home. Uh, we'll use a lot of Google Docs, but um, it is, it's important. So uh, well, I love having a distance learning person in the class. Sorry, Tanya, I'm gonna keep asking you questions. So uh, how's the Canvas thinking going at Western Kentucky? The whole state is sort of, Murray State has already switched a university here in Kentucky. So uh, we're switching now here at UK. How's Western coming along? Still Blackboard. I don't think, yeah, I don't think there's any talks of it because we're planning on the upgrade later this fall. So we're sticking with Blackboard. <laughs> yeah, Mike is choking himself. So um, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, or good for you. I don't care. It's your all's decision. Yeah. Uh, but another way that policy gets influenced is right here locally. So um, for better or worse, people at UK point to me as the guy, the person responsible for the Canvas transition. Uh, so in about a year from now, when the Canvas transition is in the middle, we're in the middle of that transition, like I will have to teach from an undisclosed location somewhere because <laughs> people will be trying to track me down and tar and feather me. Um, but I think for the whole, it's a good move for the university. So anyway, it's a good chance for you to play with Canvas. I'm guessing you've used it for some of the other EDL courses, Tanya? 
No, um, Wayne and um, Dr. Bjork use Blackboard. Uh, so this is the first time you can't use Canvas and I like it, it's nice. Yes, it is. That's why we're switching. <laughs> anyway, all right, done with all that. Now, all right, I have a, this little super, super short survey. Let me make sure I was adding questions right till the end of class. I just want to make sure that last question got in there. Yes, it did. Okay, so um, I'll put a link over here in the chat. It's also in the agenda. I have this little super short four question survey. Go ahead and take it and let's see how the results come down. All right, I'm just going to get started. We're going to talk about this big concept of law a little bit. We'll take a break in just a second, and then we're not going to go for super long tonight. All right, super. I got two responses in. I'll let another minute or minute or so see if you can get that other response in. <clears throat> oh, okay. No worries. Loading slow. I apologize. Interesting. All right, lovely. Lovely. Okay, cool. That's enough. Of, that's enough. Let me, uh, I'll display the results now. Share my screen. Here we go. So one of the things I love about Google Forms is it has this little show summary of response, quick data display. So as, it, as the data changes, it comes in in, in real time. And so uh, <clears throat> here's looking just at our five responses and, and we can see, I'll tell the rest of the class to do it and we'll have a look at their data when, when we get back to class next time. So we are somewhat mixed in the middle when we think about this word law, uh, that's good. If when I run this kind of same question for like undergrads and stuff, everyone's freaked out because they're thinking like law and order and like criminal behavior and they're worried about the law, chasing them down, whatever. So uh, I like that we are slightly more positive than normal here as, as, a, group, as, a, as a group. Um, we are unanimous in that no one has had a class on law before. <laughs> so that's interesting. Um, so I'll give you some background tonight. We're going to talk about various aspects, but this is really not going to be like an overview survey course on law. So uh, you can take one of those if you're interested in the stuff we do in class. We offer one in the department, like a basic law course for school principals. But, um, but we're going to dive just deeply on the tech issues. All right, now, question. Which of the following are law? That's an interesting, interesting response, I think, there. Well, let me zoom up a little bit more. Here we go. Which of the following are law? So the answer, I think, would be all of them. So each of those is law in some way, and we'll learn just a second in how. There's a questionable case for resolutions. So for those of you that didn't vote for resolutions, that's, a, that's probably an okay call. You could go debate that back and forth a little bit. Um, and then uh, attorney general opinions, executive orders, you know, those are debatable as well. Uh, you've probably heard of this term executive order. That's what the president does when he does not have congressional approval to do things at the federal level. 
uh, they have, we have such things at the state too. The governor can offer, uh, can do executive orders as, and the attorney general of a state frequently gets asked to interpret the law. And so those attorney general opinions wind up being part of the law as well. So yeah, answer all. All right, own comfort level with education law. I don't know if you all are seeing it or not. Let's see if I can sort of pull the screen up a little bit. Oh no, work, work, work. I'm trying to bump it up. <laughs> anyway, so we are, um, looks like most of us are five or below on comfort level with education law. So it's, it's somewhat a new topic. It's a course that you've probably never had before and uh, not so comfortable. So it's okay. We'll get more comfortable by the end of the class, I promise. I promise, I promise. All right. This is the interesting one to me. Which of the following are law? We're going to cover that in just a second a bit more. All right, let me stop sharing. Those are the results there of our little survey. So I want to talk about this concept of law a bit more. All right, so I'm going to, because I'm recording the screen here, I'm going to put a presentation up. I put a link to the Google presentation if you just want to follow along with that instead. If you want to leave the make the video big or something like that, you're free to do it on your own screen. Um, but because I'm recording, I'm gonna go ahead and put, put up a little slide deck. So let me share that right now. I'm gonna talk just a little bit about what is law. We're gonna go for a couple minutes, so we're gonna take a break, and we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit more. Because uh, So this is probably the only real lecture-based stuff we're gonna do in this class, but since we're recording tonight, it's a good night to do it, and also, to just get a sense of what the heck we're doing in this class. Because that's a pretty big question probably lingering out there for all of you. Share screen only, let's see, I want to, let's see now if I go to this, what happens? It's sharing that screen, that's not what I'm wanting. Not what I'm wanting. Let's stop the share. All right, super. So now let me try again. Share screen. All right, let's see. Oh, still not super pleased, super happy. Oh, dang it. Come on, behave. Share a new window. Let's try that. Sorry, I'm still learning my Zoom a bit. Still learning it. Oh, I see. I got to share an entire desktop. Ah, now I know. I see. All right, fine. But it's not resolving at the right level, correct? Mm, 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 mm. Okay. Still not resolving. God dang it. Right, it's not the right size on your all's computers. Is that correct? It is correct. It's not resolving. It just says law for leaders and it doesn't really say what's going on. Okay. Okay. Totally backwards and messed up at the moment. Stop share. I'll just make it work in a different way. Okay, so let me pull this open. Sorry for those of you viewing at home, just bear with me for a second. And I'll have it up and running. Does it show? We'll do it this way. We'll just share that little window and I'll just make it work. All right, superb. Make that go away. Leave that there in the middle. Zoom in a little bit. Like so. And that should work okay. Thumbs up working okay? All right. Fine, fine, fine. Fine, fine, fine. 
All right, so here's what I want to talk about for just a few minutes in class tonight, and I want to get on recorded video. I, you all are pretty new to this concept of law. You didn't spend three years in law school, which I wouldn't wor would not wish on my worst enemy. It's that kind of bad, but I wouldn't trade it for the world because I get to learn all the rules. So that was pretty cool, but uh, <laughs> it took a lot of pain to get a pretty good understanding. So. So I want to address what is law tonight, and then we're going to address what is law and tech, and then we're going to address what is law and tech and ed. All right, so we're going to just start with law. Okay, so um, sorry this is showing up weird because I don't have it displayed. So the question I want to start with is <clears throat> I want you to be thinking about law as one part of a way in which we regulate society. We're going to use this guy in class tonight named Lawrence Lessig. He's a professor at Harvard. I'm going to tell a story about Lawrence here in a few minutes. But what I really love about how he thinks about the world is he thinks about the world in, in different ways that we could regulate society. And he thinks about those as like the underlying code of humanity. All right. And I really like that way of thinking about things. And that, that underlying code of humanity allows us to regulate society in a few different ways. Uh, law is one of those ways. Let's take a look at the other ways though first. So the first way that we regulate society is through markets. All right, so uh, you can insert random private school here for this slide. I inserted a private school from Singapore that was eye-opening for me, so their little tagline of opening eyes certainly did it for me because it was really impressive school um, <clears throat> these private schools all function in a marketplace you know this is not news to you you're aware of it and so living in that marketplace really regulates their behavior in terms of what programs they decide to offer how many what their teacher student ratios are all that kinds of stuff in which they're trying to recruit students that all helps to self-regulate them inside the marketplace. Not a shock. Next one is architecture, all right? So these are a couple of my STEAM kids, by the way. That is uh, Kavion in the front, Kivion in the front, and Tiffany in the back. Um, hanging with one of our little Dell laptops that we have for everyone at our school. So that architecture, the technology, the school buildings, all those architectural elements are also regulating our behavior. You know, we can only do what we can do here in this class in our little digital Zoom room because the architecture allows for some things and not for others. So I can share my screen in class tonight, but I can't do breakout rooms here in this Zoom room because that's the architecture of our classroom here tonight. So not a surprise. That's sort of how that rolls. Fine, we move on. Norms, of course, are probably the biggest regulator inside schools. So, so much of what's happening inside a public school or inside a private school or inside a college or a university is being regulated by norms. You all are being very kind right now, being quiet, letting me lecture, very boring, horrible stuff, because it's the norm of what you do as a student inside of a higher education course. You know, you let professors pontificate a bit, which I'm sorry for, and this will probably be my last time I do it in this class. Uh, so these are, again, some of my kids. They had to build their own country this last month. So uh, these norms are constantly regulating, and kids are being learning these norms, and we all function in these norms all the time on a daily basis. You know, it's, it's everywhere. And once you start to see this underlying code, you start to see the market impacts on things, or you see the architectural limitations of things. When you see norms regulating, you have a really good sense of how we're functioning as a society and getting by on a daily basis. Of course, inside the classroom, norms are the primary regulator. In our classroom tonight, you all relying on norms, not on like statutes. I didn't start class with a long list of here are the laws of class tonight based on KRS something something, Kentucky Revised Statute something something something. That's not how we roll, we roll with norms on spaces like this. All right, fine, 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 fine. But now back to this, the one that I'm interested in talking about tonight because it really impacts the, the law and the policy space and the, the digital equity spaces, all that kind of stuff is around this concept of law. All right, so I, this is a little reminder to myself in the presentation. So over in the chat, 
you should be able to still see the chat in your um, in your window. I'm going to put a link to a Google presentation. It's also in the agenda if you're playing along at home in the agenda. Uh, and this Google presentation, I want you to do just one thing. I want you to think of an image that is representative of this word law and insert said image in presentation. All right, just pick a random slide and put your name at the bottom and just put one image, a single image, that's it. And as you do that, uh, we'll take a few minutes, grab coffee, grab a bathroom break, something like that. We'll meet back up at like 642 we'll keep we'll get rolling again at 642 so throw up one image take a coffee break see you at 642 I remember we were in the coffee you're going no you, <laughs> you kept it in okay There's something appealing about a simple analysis that we could all wrap our heads around. Something like that that makes you feel like, ah, oh, if you wanted to add something to it, nice, and then we get a little bit of And we go, go, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, let's see how belonging, let's see if there are gender differences in belonging. So this, the, this is a study about how kids feel like they belong in school. And we looked at how they've probably been treated outside of school, stigmatized, but does that then affect how they feel in school? Or this is their this is the storytelling, right? I don't care what the results are. I don't no, know results. <laughs> what they wrote on their opening uh, Yeah, they do. But the, right, okay, but do there's like does the perception of feeling stigmatized then make them just higher outside stigma? higher inside belonging? It would seem so. I think I would hypothesize that. The literature though, I think I don't know. I feel like the economists, uh, I don't know. I had some one
All right. Super. We'll do about 20 more seconds. I'm thinking, realizing now I probably should have not given the exact time. I should have just said, did I say five minutes? Because the people watching on video are probably going to be like, what the hell? 642. That means nothing to me. <laughs> oh, uh, sorry, guys. Everyone watching on video at home, apologize for that part. But hopefully you're still making it happen. Okay, so we'll jump over here. Let me share screen again. You, see, you can all see the images added if you're playing through the agenda. Uh, so we have um, Lissa adding an image of Law and Order SVU. Like, how many different Law and Orders are there nowadays? Is there just a couple, or is there like Law and Order Vegas style? Or I guess that's CNI, CSI Vegas style. Or something like I haven't that. watched Law and Order in so long, but I think like between CSI and Law and Order. Yeah, and CSI. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. So one thing about being an attorney is that you uh, don't watch any of these shows because they're weird. Maybe other attorneys do. Other lawyers can handle it. But for me, it's just like, this is so not real. Like, horrible. Go away. So the average lawyer does not go to court. You know, the majority of lawyers do not go to court on a daily basis. And of those that even do go to court, which is a minority of lawyers, most do civil cases, not criminal cases. So all the law and orders, the CSIs, all that kind of stuff is a very small percentage of the whole world of law. Uh, it is obviously a very made-for-TV type of law because we always have some huge problem that we're trying to solve or a great detective story. I do love, like, um, I love the British version, Benedict Cumberbatch as Sherlock on uh, the BBC. Spectacular. Have you guys seen, I, I'm trying to convince my wife to, to pay the $10 or whatever it costs to go to a movies nowadays to go see the new Benedict Cumberbatch movie on um, Alan Turing's, uh, I don't, forget the name of it, but it's about the Enigma machine. And I uh, really want to go see that one as well, but cannot convince the wife that that is worth $10 somehow. You know, it's not a rom-com. So, uh, so far, no, no luck. Is that the uh, is that the bad guy from Star Trek Into Darkness? Yes, exactly. Okay. He is awesome. Yeah, a spectacular. He's probably yeah. my favorite actor going at the moment. So, spectacular actor. All right. So, uh, interesting, Bobby. Tell me more about the trophy. Yeah, turn audio on. There you go. Uh My computer is so lagging, and I do not want to give up my silver keys. I'm going to have to. Um, I don't know. You said a moment ago that uh, you were so glad you went to law school because you learned all the rules. Mm -hmm. And when you know the rules, you can catch people that don't know the rules, and then you are the winner. So. <laughs> wow. Wow. Okay. Very competitive <laughs> cutthroat image of law so yeah there was a new story here in um in louisville about uh maybe about two weeks ago now one of our big time attorneys here in kentucky he's on television all the time trying to drum up new business his name is daryl isaacs they call him the hammer he was biking and he got hit by a car and like so i'm thinking of him right now with that picture of the trophy because i mean he is gonna cash in that poor person who hit the hammer lawyer as he was biking. Like, he might as well just bring the deed to their house to the hearing because he's going to get it all. <laughs> so, all right, awesome. Uh, Tanya, want to say anything? This is a very traditional image of law. Yeah, I, that's what comes to mind. It's just that classic imagery of the, the gavel and the... Yeah, let's see. <laughs> I, have, I keep a gavel. Here it is. I keep a gavel with me at all times. Never know when you need to call class to order. Yeah, it's effective. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Don't you guys want to check? You know, anytime you need the gavel, I got it over here. All right. Yes, so gavel. So good call. It's, um, it is a very traditional notion of, of law and justice, and uh, we use it. I use it from time to time. And I wish I could hand you a gavel. When we do our little court cases here in class in the virtual space, feel free to bring a gavel when you are the judges. 
and like just randomly make noises and beat it down. I love it. All right, Mike, choosing order over chaos. Fascinating. You are good at image searching. We have learned a new skill for you tonight. <laughs> image searching, it is something you are superb at. <clears throat> Any comments? I just see the law as actually the antithesis of chaos. And in the absence of either, you get the other. Yeah, very nice. Very, uh, almost makes me think of the scientific laws, you know, like Newton's law, that kind of stuff. You know, I don't know, you're thinking of chaos and chaos theory and I don't know, string theory. I don't know, I could go on for a while. I'm mildly into physics. I feel like everyone should be. I don't know if that's... <laughs> If you haven't read um, A Brief History of Time, uh, they're making a movie of him now, too. Um, what's, can't, his name is escaping me at the moment. Mr. Hawking? Yes, Stephen. Um, making a movie about him now, I see as well. So that should be interesting. A Brief Maybe. History is one of the most fascinating pieces of literature I've ever read. Yeah, it's in my top ten books I've read in my life, A Brief History of Time. So, and then Wendy... Uh, very, since we're talking of English, he's a, he's a professor at Cambridge, and so since the old English view of law, nice, I like it. I should just wear wigs randomly, Wibs, wigs and robes, just wear them around from time to time, just to reinforce, like, yeah, I'm weird. I, hey, I'm weird. Please do. I'll go, go with the wig, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. of course, we couldn't see the go-go boots, but... <laughs> <laughs> I am losing my hair anyway, so this might be a good solution to the hair loss <laughs> problem. <laughs> like, if you want to be recognized, like wear a white wig, wig around all the time. Man. Okay, now we, now we might think that you're a little bit tired. <laughs> Is it kicking in? Kicking in now. Yeah, it might getting be kicking a, in. <laughs> getting a little punchy. All right, fine. So let me see if I can switch back very nicely to my little deck here and show you what I think of when I think of this word, law. So, this one. All right, let's share screen, and hopefully that works out nicely. Yes, looks like it has. Fine. So when I think of law nowadays, here's, here's what I think of, and it probably is gonna be a surprise to you. I think of law as an operating system, which is odd, but I do, I sort of think about like Windows 7, I don't think about Windows 8 because I don't understand Windows 8, but I sort of think Windows 7 when I think about law. Uh, because I view law more and more and more over time as this underlying operating system that underlies everything that we're doing in society. And so just like an operating system, just like an operating system, there is no actual thing that it does it just allows everything else to run. So programs run on top of the operating system. Um, you navigate through all the different pieces of the society or of the computer by using the underlying operating system. And that's very much what law is as well. And in the, so in the same way that there are millions and millions of lines of code that make up the operating system of any given operating system, millions of lines of code, the same applies for us in law. There are millions and millions of lines of code that are codified as statutes and regulations and all these things that underlie our society. And that serves as the basic functioning components of how we interact with each other on a, a daily basis and, and how the various systems work. So that's how I think about law nowadays. I really like that analogy, especially since we're here in somewhat of a technology course. I think it is an apt analogy. So, but like an operating system, so here's a bunch of different operating systems, there are different opportunities, there are different versions, there are different possibilities inside of law. You know, there isn't a single set of laws that are universally applicable. You know, I guess besides Newton's law, that seems like it works pretty well, but we don't know yet. There might be multiple dimensions out there. Oh, see, isn't physics fun? All right, so... These operating systems, they come into existence, they can go out of existence. We in the United States have been using a sort of the same operating system, the same kernel of the operating system now for about 220 years, something like that. But the other countries' operating systems come into and out of existence much more frequently. 
So Lissa's hanging out in Kuwait right now. I'm guessing Kuwait's operating system is probably less than 50 years old. Is that, do you have any sense of when the last like constitution of Kuwait was been passed, Lisa? Um, the, gosh, we have our National Liberation Day in like two weeks. I think we're something like, yeah, less than 50, around the 50 year mark. But then mm -hmm. um, we've also, since we've been here two and a half years, I think they've dissolved the parliament like two or three times. <laughs> so, you know. Exactly. So they had to do like a system <laughs> reboot a few times. Like the alphabet yeah. system might still be functioning, but they went ahead and shut the system down. Let's do a restart, see if it fixes anything. <laughs> yes. So like our, our, the emir doesn't really like what's going on. He like mm -hmm. it, when it gets too conservative, he just like shuts it down, and then everybody votes again, and we get a new legislature. Yeah, exactly. Parliament. I don't like you people. Go away. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, exactly. So, different operating systems of law are in existence for different periods of time. We ours happens to be a relatively old operating system, but our operating system really allows for a lot of very flexible updating, and so uh, it has seen it has held for quite a while. So fine. Like these operating systems, though, they can go wrong. Things break inside of them. They must be updated. Uh, the kernel, the, the back end of these operating systems from time to time can be hacked. All kinds of like, bad things can happen with the operating system. And the same, of course, applies to law. So we, I just I'll pose this question to you. Does it work? Do you feel like the law, if, if it is an operating system for society, here, let's sort of stick with here in the United States. I'm sure Lisa could make all kinds of statements about how the operating system is working in Kuwait. Um, but here in the United States, is the operating system working okay right now? No one, are you scared to jump in? The operating system is working, but it needs a service pack. <laughs> oh, I gotcha. We need a major update kind of thing. We need to download a whole new set of instructions and restart the computer and run again. At least a few patches. Okay, I gotcha. I gotcha. All right, fine. Now, I want to start talking about tech and law. So if law is an operating system, let's start to think about how technology functions relative to that operating system. All right, so law plus tech equals question mark. So I want to start with a little bit of a story. And I'm going to give you an example of where law, in my opinion, is clearly broken, all right? Clearly non-functional inside of our operating system at the moment. All right, so the story is not mine. It's one of Professor Lawrence Lessig's. He's the guy I referenced earlier in class tonight. This is him. My P12 students, I talked about him. My, my high school freshman thought I looked like him. I would say, yeah, why not? But uh, unfortunately, I'm a little heavier set. I have that big chubby face like you saw with Lucy, so whatever. All right, so all my slides are not popping up perfectly here. I'll have to figure out how to do slides in Zoom. I think I've done them before and I didn't have problems, so I don't know what, what I'm doing tonight. So Professor Lessig added a C to copyright, which is a weird thing to do. And I'm gonna tell you about it because I think it's interesting, but in doing so, I, I think we'll learn something about the operating system. All right, so you all seen that first symbol there, the C with a big circle around it. You've seen that one, all right? And increasingly, people are getting familiar with that second symbol, which is not closed captioning. Frequently, that's what everyone always goes for. Uh, but instead, it's this concept called Creative Commons. So I'm going to tell you about Professor Lessig and Creative Commons to help you understand that there are flaws in the operating system and how sometimes we go about fixing those flaws. So to do that, I want to go back a bit. So I want to ask you first, like, why do we have this thing called copyright? Anyone want to jump in? Anyone copyrighted anything in your life? Does, does trademark fall under there? It's related, but all of you would have copyrighted something in your life because it's the default. It comes, you've created something in your life, even if it's going back to kindergarten and you painted some new little design on a blank sheet of paper, boom, you own the copyright to that blank sheet of paper that you've put all those colors on as a kindergartner. So copyright is the default. It comes with any new creative work that someone creates. And so we created it in the Constitution. And sorry, let me move pieces around because my slides are not going properly. 
So there's the Constitution, lovely. In Article 8 of Section, in Section 8 of Article 1 of the Constitution, the Congress has this power, and gosh, yes, this is a little bit complicated tonight because I have these crazy things, so let me delete that. Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their writings and discoveries. Boom, there we go. Congress can do copyright. And they did. In the year immediately following the passage of the Constitution, the very first Copyright Act was passed. Here's what they want to do. So that's Mr. Hemingway. He's an author. He wrote a few books. Perhaps you've heard of him. So he would like to make money for his ideas. You know, he doesn't want to do something else. He doesn't want to have to work a second job. He'd like to write these books, get paid money for those books, and then go hang out on a beach down in Puerto Rico or I don't know, whatever Mr. Hemingway chose to do with his time. Perfectly fine. That is the underlying concept. And we think that if we pay Mr. Mr. Hemingway for those ideas, he's likely to have more ideas. That's not, not a shocker. That seems like a relatively cogent concept. Fine. So in 1790, they passed the very first Copyright Act. The Copyright Act was for 13 years. You, were, you had exclusive rights to your creation that you just made for 13 years. And then if you really, really needed it, you could petition Congress to have 13 more years if you really needed a renewal on that copyright. Okay, so 13 years, that's what we passed right off the bat, right after we wrote Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution on Copyright. Several years later, 40 years later, we extended that term up to 26 years. Um, like 70 years after that, we just added an extra little bit of renewal to it. But then in 1976, things really got interesting. We decided, hey, we don't like this whole, you know, short period of copyright. Things coming into the public, um, the public domain. When it's in the public domain, anyone can use it. So anyone can make copies of Mr. Hemingway's work without any repercussions. They can remix it, do whatever. In 1976, you know, this is the, t the era of television coming into its own. We decide, hey, wait a second, we need a longer term of copyright, and we bump that thing up to 75 years. Then in 1998, you've heard of Sonny and Cher, correct? You remember this guy. Cher is the one with the really long hair. Sonny was her partner. We had the Sonny Bono Copyright Act of 1998 when we said that, hey, 75 years, that's not enough. Let's take the term of copyright up to 120 years. So if tonight you just created these new little images, well, you probably copied and pasted. We'll talk about that in a, in a second. But we created some new work in class tonight. That piece of work would be protected for 120 years. So let's see if we do the math. The year 2140, 2135. Yeah, 2135, it would come out of copyright. So you would be the exclusive owner of that for the next 120 years. Okay, weird, eh? We passed this thing called fair use in 1976, which is good. Fair use is the one that gives us a little bit of flexibility around the edges of copyright. It's not very big, pretty small, little uh, area around copyright. <clears throat> and then in education, we have these things that are different because we want to treat business people differently than we treat uh, school children. And so we give additional guidelines for what educators can do relative to copyright. Um, so in education, as long as it's brief, spontaneous, and has low cumulative effect, we can make some additional copies. So that's fine. That's no worries. Um, so here is the definition of brevity for instance, which I just found to be beautifully ironic in the educational guidelines on copyright, which are, by the way, in legislative testimony. So here's a form of law that is purely testimony that was given in front of Congress, never actually codified, but these educational guidelines are used all over the country. So here's a whole form of law you've probably never even heard of, which is legislative testimony. So it's hard to read, I understand, because I love the definition of brevity is not brief at all. But if you have a poem of less than 250 words, you can copy the whole thing. If the poem is more than 250 words, you can copy a section of up to 250 words. If you have a piece of prose, a, a, a novel or something like that, uh, if it's less than 2,500 words, you can copy it all. If it's more than that, you can only copy up to 10% of the work. So crazy really specific definitions of what we can and cannot use in copyright when it comes to schools. 
Okay, lovely. Let's move forward. This translates into policies all over the country. So your school, whether you're a higher education institution uh, like Western Kentucky or BCTC or you're a public school either here in the United States or even somewhere else in the world probably has a policy on copyright. Uh, so this happens to be one from West Virginia, no, uh, from Louisiana. And uh, so this is all the guidelines just for one school district in Louisiana. And because I don't have the little animations, I'll just have to scroll up and keep scrolling. Hold on, I gotta keep scrolling for a while. Keep scrolling, keep scrolling, keep scrolling, keep scrolling. And we're still not there. Let's keep going, keep scrolling, keep scrolling. Still not there. Keep scrolling, keep scrolling. Oh, good, we've reached the end. So that is a single district's policy on copyright in schools. Now you can imagine that multiplied by every single school and university in the United States, and you can see just how rapidly this educational policy can become a behemoth. Like, hard to wrap your brain around how much policy there is in the United States. All right, fine. That's fine, that's fine, that's fine. Back to my story. I wanna to talk to you about Mr. Lessig. So we have a problem, and it's easiest if I just let him tell the problem. Um, his concern was that the architecture changed, all right? The architecture, the underlying architecture. Because remember, architecture is a regulator in the same way that law is a regulator. It's actually easier just to let him explain it. So this is about four minutes if you can, um, I'll put copy and paste this into the chat. I don't have this in the, in the agenda. I'll put it in the agenda right now, but it's in the chat. Uh, you all have your audio off, so that's fine. So like just four minutes, I'll put the link right here. Uh, this, it's on blip, which is an old, this is an older video and it's probably gonna have a uh, commercial to start. So I apologize for that. Thank you. 
Okay, stop when he reaches point number two. When he turns to point number two, stop then. It should be coming up for all of you. Okay, good. Everyone done? Thumbs up when you're done. Okay, good. Good, good, good. Looks like we have done it. Now, fine. As Professor Lessig implies, a major thing has changed in copyright, which is not a surprise. We've had major changes to the architecture of society in that the ability for us to make copies has changed dramatically. The technology has changed that allows us, instead of having to even run to a Xerox machine and hit the green button, now control C or shift C or whatever it is on a PC. I'm sorry, it's been a long time since I've used PCs. Control C makes a copy. Control V creates the new document. That, every time that happens, is a potential copyright violation. You're making a copy and you might not have the right to make that copy, that's copyright. Fine, every time that happens, a potential copyright violation ensues. Now, Professor Lessig did something about it, and I, of course, make the point that that's what professors should do. It bothers me when professors don't actually go about changing the world once they say, hey, we should change the world. So um, that's what we're gonna try to do in this class by writing policy documents. So he did something about it, and he created a new architecture that new architecture is called Creative Commons. You don't have to read the whole thing. For those watching at home, you can, pay, you can pause and watch the whole thing. We're not gonna do it, but he gives the whole rationale for why such a thing needs to be creative. And then they create Creative Commons. What it does is it allows Mr. Hemingway to make a direct connection with the reader, with the end user. There's an end user, as you can see, he's reading a book by Ernest Hemingway, loving that shirt that he's wearing in that little image there, the Book It shirt. Uh, if you remember the old Book It programs from school. Reading Mr. Hemingway. So Mr. Hemingway can make a direct contract with the end user, allow the end user to read and use the work without having to pay Mr. Hemingway, but stops 
anyone from using the work if they intend to make money off of the work. All right, so this is a new way to think about structuring this relationship in society between the creator of a work and a user of the work. That whole thing was called Creative Commons. This is what a Creative Commons contract looks like. And I gotta scroll up for a while. You know, these contracts are pretty long and detailed and complicated. There's the end of the Creative Commons contract. Yeah, that's horrible, right? No one's ever gonna read that. So luckily we just created some symbols that does, says everything that is in that little document. So maybe you've seen these symbols sitting around before in society, you've seen them online somewhere, that little Creative Commons logo up there at the top, and then the buy, the non-commercial, and the no derivative works, um, different logos. So you put something up online, you add the images that you want to apply, you add these little circles that you want to apply, so you want people to attribute to you, the creator of the work, you want no one to make money from your work, and you won't, don't want any derivative works, then you, boom, you add those little labels, and you have created this agreement that allows the work to be shared in the public domain as long as no one is making money from it. That's lovely. That's how Professor Lessig added AC to copyright. So there we go. All right, fantastic. Lots and lots and lots of institutions use Creative Commons, the White House included, of course, much of what's on Wikipedia, big media companies like Al Jazeera, uh, Flickr, as much as pushed, posted in Creative Commons in Flickr, pardon me, there are over 800, oh, I've missed a zero somewhere in my, so that's a good thing about being in this little platform is I can add the zero back in, uh, over 800 million works out there that have li are licensed Creative Commons that we can use in society without having, as long as we attribute, but without having to pay. And it's growing rapidly. There'll be over a billion different items licensed with Creative Commons soon enough. I checked just yesterday. That's what, where we're at, somewhere around 800 million works. Fine. That's the story of Professor Lessig and copyright. But what I want, I told the story, though, for is because I have a concern, not a surprise. This whole thing, as it applies to education, really tells some stories that we're going to deal with in this class. All right? At the root of what's going on is a flaw in the operating system, in this operating system of copyright law that was passed. That root of that operating system was put into existence back in 1897 when we passed the Constitution. Um, and it still is with us today. And that, those, that operating system has been updated in the past in 1998 when we took it to 120 years. That decision at that moment, the Sonny Bono Copyright Act, really is a break in the operating system. It is where the operating system is now causing massive problems. Why? Because our kids are criminals. That's not a good situation. On any given classroom, on any given day, the majority of the kids in that room are criminals, I, especially as the older you get, the high school kids, campuses like Western Kentucky, just criminals everywhere on Western Kentucky's campus. Man, what a crazy campus you all run out there. Most of our teachers are criminals. A lot of our schools are liable potentially for this. And the punishment for copyright is not insignificant. It is a very large fine and up to 20 years in prison for copyright violations. So uh, there's potentially really, really significant um, sanctions for this criminal behavior. And of course, Crazy things happen, like every single day at UK's campus, thousands of kids are violating the law multiple times a day. So here is a situation, if law is an operating system, clearly the operating system has broken. There's something wrong in the operating system. What we're gonna spend a lot of time dealing with in this class is the implications of technology on the educational operating system. We're going to ask this question a lot in this class. Does the law work? Does the policy work? Does the underlying structure of what's going on in schools work on a given area? And we're going to look at lots of different areas in this class as we are rapidly changing the technology, right? Because technology is not stopping. It's going fast. There's all kinds of different exponential curves I can give you. This is the one that everyone talks about, Moore's Law. Um, which is the computing power of a basic little transistor like here on my laptop 
is doubling every year and a half or so. And that has held since the 70s. And I guess it will continue to hold into the future. Lots of people talk about the end of Moore's Law. See, there's Mike. He's worried that the end of Moore's Law might be near. Perhaps it is. But whatever. The basic concept of the exponential growth of technology is pretty difficult to argue with. And so within that context of tech exponential growth of technology and the underlying law, the operating system, we find ourselves in schools. Higher education, P12 education, daycares, early childcare, all of this is having to function within both the law and rapidly changing technology. Fine. Um, I want to talk just a bit about school law. This is all we're going to, the whole background of school law is going to take just a couple of minutes here because, <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't know what to do about it. It is what it is. So back in the ye old constitution, that operating system that we started back in, um, back in the 1790s, there is no mention of that word education. It does not come up. They talked about it at the Constitutional Convention. They thought maybe they should address it in some way, maybe. Uh, back in the 1700s, though, uh, you know, schools didn't mean what they mean today. It was mostly for uh, men, and, most, and those men needed to be white, of course, and uh, also they needed to be rich. And if you met all of those criteria, maybe you went to school. So school, of course, meant something very different when we built this operating system. And so we decided, sorry, this, I'm, this thing is popping up weird, uh, that the, delete that out from behind it, that the 10th Amendment, of course, gives all the powers not delegated to the United States, it's reserved to the states. So we have in the educational space, whether you like it or not, you understand it or not, we have a system of 50 different countries functioning when it comes to education in the U.S., and that's because the Constitution does not address education. So Congress, does that mean that Congress stays out of education? No, of course it does not. Of course it does not. We do things like the No Child Left Behind Act, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the Higher Education Act, uh, all kinds of laws out there where the federal government is trying to tell us how to run schools. They do this through a very, very fancy and weird mechanism. Anyone know what it is? Not all at once, it's okay. You don't know how we run schools at the federal level in, in the United States? It's this really, really old way of doing business called bribery. <laughs> that is how the federal government operates schools in the United States. They do it through bribery. They tell a given state, hey Kentucky, or hey Virginia, uh, we would really like for you to test your kids in this particular way. It'd be really cool if you would test your kids in third grade and fifth grade and eighth grade and 11th grade, or what, no, it's three through, three through eight and then also in 10th grade. That's the current law on No Child Left Behind. We'd really like for you to do that, Virginia. Um, we understand that maybe you have some reservations, so to help convince you that this is a really good idea that you should do, here is $100 million. And you can have that $100 million if you'd be so kind as to implement at the state level these set of laws that we passed here in Washington. And uh, so right now, every state has taken the No Child Left Behind bargain. Uh, it has, um, yeah, don't even get you started, I understand. Um, every state's taken that bargain. There was Utah almost backed out and Connecticut almost backed out. So like the most Republican state and the most liberal state have both talked about backing out of No Child Left Behind in the past. Um, they actually had to, Utah was the closest. Um, Salt Lake schools did not want to back out. So uh, they were going to give all the money to Salt Lake that they were going to give to the whole state of Utah. And once the whole state of Utah found out that Salt Lake was going to get all the money, they decided, oh, no, no, wait a second. We want our cut. We want our cut. So uh, that was going to be a major embarrassment to the Bush administration. So there was huge negotiations underway in Utah to keep Utah involved in No Child. Yes, Mike? What did Indiana just do? Um, they just backed out of something. Oh, did they? Yeah. So I've been teaching citizenship to freshmen, high school freshmen the last month. So did, I'm a little did, out of the loop. Didn't they just jump ship on Common Core, guys? Oh, yeah. So, good example. Common Core is a perfect example. So, everyone hears this term, Common Core. Um, and it's certainly something that was pushed by the Obama administration in this latest thing called Race to the Top. Uh, they 
they bribed, it was even a second layer of bribery on top of the initial layer of bribery. Um, so it's spectacular. <laughs> this is how countries run. Welcome to the world. So um, yes, they pushed the Common Core. Many states have backed out of the Common Core, but you understand though, see that states are the ultimate arbiter of how, a, how an education system runs. So we here in Kentucky and in Virginia, everyone has our own constitutions. Every state has their own constitutions because they really are, truly are 50 different countries. I'm not joking. They truly are 50 different countries. And when it comes to public schools, that is exactly how we function. We function as 50 separate countries. That is why when you're licensed to be a teacher in Kentucky, you are not licensed to be a teacher in Tennessee. Each state has its own licensure system and you have to be licensed just in that country and you're not licensed in the country that's next door, even though us in Tennessee, there's not that much difference. Like when it comes to public schools, yes, there is. It's two separate countries. <laughs> Crazy, right? But it does, there's reciprocity. Yep, many times, times states. It's, it's completely bizarre moving from one state to another and teaching, which I've done many times. Yeah. It is, it is totally like going to another country. Yeah, because it actually is. <laughs> <laughs> I know that sounds crazy. We think of ourselves as the United States, but when it comes to public schools and higher education as well, we really are 50 different entities that all sort of have very similar laws, but we all have our own laws. We all have very distinct laws. Uh, so everyone has their own state constitution. We here in Kentucky have our state constitution. This word efficient, if it's showing up, so there I'm highlighting the word efficient. You should be seeing it. That word efficient shut down the entire education system about 25 years ago. In 1989, we had a case here in Kentucky that questioned, hey, did the General Assembly actually provide for efficient schools? The state Supreme Court said, no, we did not. Therefore, the entire system is shut down. So if any of you were alive here in Kentucky during the CARA period, the, in 1990, we refired the whole system under the Kentucky Education Reform Act. Um, and so, we actually did shut down public education in Kentucky in 1989, <laughs> which is a weird period. Anyone in school at, during that period? Yes, you were, Tanya? You remember that when that thing happened? I mean, theoretically, everyone was fired. Now, teachers, of course, kept their jobs with local boards, but theoretically, the system did not exist for about a six-month period there. We had no public education system in Kentucky for about six months. And at Frankfurt, actually, everyone actually was fired. The whole Kentucky Department of Education was new, newly created. Everyone had to reapply for their jobs. Uh, so it was, a, it was a total shutdown. It was very odd. But those kinds of things can happen at a state level. So the state governments, here is the picture of the Kentucky Capitol. It's a beautiful capital. If you've not had a chance, go check it out in Frankfurt. I'll be there in a few days hearing that bill on school superintendent searches. These state legislatures are the ones that ultimately control public schools, which is weird, but it is how it works. So the ultimate authority for all things school is the Kentucky legislature. That is where issues are ultimately decided, such as what are we gonna teach in schools, which is what the Common Core debate has been all about. That's why it's such a hot topic, because it is the question of what are we gonna teach in schools? That is a state legislative decision. And at the state legislature, you remember, I'm just a bill back from old schoolhouse rock days. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how it actually works. Uh, you, you know, this class calls on seventh grade social studies probably more than any other class you'll have in your life. So um, <laughs> I'm just a bill is how it actually works. Uh, laws get passed in that way in Frankfurt. That's what Professor Lewis was working on today. There's a bill on charters that he testified in support of at the Kentucky legislature. And... Uh, New laws come into and out of existence in Frankfurt in, in that way. That's not the end of the story, though. Remember that I asked you in our little survey, what is law? So the Kentucky legislature, this little group, they create a particular type of law. They create a law called statutes. All right, that's what they do. It's all compiled up into a, a book that's called the school code. And uh, I'll show you what the school code looks like some class going forward, but it's a, it's a very thick book of statutes that is just like the underlying code of an operating system. It is the most important part of that code, probably. Underneath that statutes, though, 
our regulations. So this is a picture of Frankfort, Kentucky, which is a weird picture to show you. I know it's one of the smallest state capitals for those not here in Kentucky, in Virginia and in Kuwait. It's a very small town. It happens to have just a couple of very tall buildings. <laughs> and those very tall buildings really indicate what state government actually does. All right, so uh, let's see if I can get like a pointer here on the screen. Yeah, it looks like I can. All right, so we're gonna start with this little building right here in the very middle, which is like the low rise long building here in the middle. That is our Department of Transportation. So one thing that states do is build and maintain roads and bridges and they salt them and all that kind of stuff. It's our Department of Transportation. This is our Department of Health and Human Services building. We provide insurance at the state level. All of the whole Obamacare fight has really happened at the state level. Again, the federal government sort of bribing states into participating in a federal program. But each state had to decide on its own implementation of Obamacare and Medicaid and all that kind of stuff that happens there in Frankfurt in that building. And then this really tall one back here in the back, the tallest building in Frankfurt, this is our Department of Education. Because education is one of, if not the primary thing that state governments do. It's pretty much, it's not their only job, but you could make a good case that it's their main job. So operating not only the public schools, but all the public universities, providing all the regulations for all the private schools, that all happens right here in this tall building. Actually, the Council on Post-Secondary Education, CPE, sits in a different building, but don't worry about it. I got higher educators in the classroom with me tonight, so there is such a building. I've been to it, met with Bob King. I've been to a meetings of the board of the, the Council for Post-Secondary Education. Um, it's not nearly as exciting. It's very dull building. It's, uh, it's like behind, I don't know if you guys have been or not, it sits behind the strip mall. <laughs> it's, yeah, exactly. It's, it's not what you think of when you think this is the building that regulates all of higher education in Kentucky. Yeah, it's like behind a strip mall. <laughs> anyway, the building that regulates public schools is the tallest one in Frankfurt. So that's what that one there in the middle does. Now, the Kentucky Department of Education, it passes regulations. They interpret those statutes and they add way more detail to the statutes, all right? So these regulatory bodies are the ones that actually have to do what the legislature thinks should be done. So they need way more detailed laws to actually achieve what the legislature wants. And so they pass regulations to actually achieve. Those regulations wind up looking like this. This is a list of all of the certification regulations in the state of Kentucky at our Education Professional Standards Board. All right, so all of those 16 KAR 1.010, all each one of those is a different regulation for how each person in a school building should be certified. All right, and you can see some of the crazy ones like here sits school nurses. So how are we gonna certify school nurses? Well, we have a regulation on that and everything else. Yep, they get crazy and detailed and horrible, and that's what it is. Now, we're getting to the end of the story. At the bottom of this whole little game sits a school. And whether that school looks like this or it looks like something on the top of a hill in Bowling Green, Kentucky, Hilltoppers is very accurate, by the way, for those of you not in Kentucky. It actually is on the top of a very tall, t tall hill, which I have walked up in the past and ran out of breath doing, because it is that kind of a hill. Where do you work at on the hill, uh, Tanya, relative to that hill? Do you, do you work on the top of the hill or somewhere at the bottom, on the sides? No, I work at the top. You work Garrett, at the very top? At the top, Garrett Conference Center. It's right behind Cherry Hall, the big statue of mm -hmm. the vice president. Mm -hmm. Very nice. All right, so your school building could look like that. It could look like a university like UK. It could look like a daycare center like I send my kids to at preschool. All of those sit at the sort of the, not the bottom, not the very bottom level, but towards the bottom of the sort of system, the operating system with which we operate public schools, all right? Now these entities here, these schools, they actually are super important when it comes to law, all right? Because inside of each of these are laws like this crazy copyright guideline, right? So this is a law. We call it at the school level or at the university level or at the community college, we'll call it a policy, but make no mistake about it, it is a law. Everything is law. 
law is the operating system. It's the big picture old thing that lives out there. There are many different types of code that live inside of law, statutes, regulations, policies, case law. All of that is just different forms of code inside this big concept of law. All right, so schools, of course, pass policies. Those policies only apply locally, or they only apply to a single university or a single campus, but they are the most detailed version of written law that we have. Pretty, they get pretty detailed, like the copyright guidelines here in Louisiana, which of course I don't have to remind you, is really, really long, just on copyright. So if you wanna spend, waste many, many hours, you can go, I'll put it up over here in the chat, policy.ksba.org, you can go to that web address, and you can see all the school policies in the state of Kentucky, and actually not quite all of them, but most of them. You can pull down a given district, and then that'll give you access to just thousands of pages of school policies. Inside of here are millions of pages of local school policies, just inside this one database, right? And so every single institution, you're in an education institution, you know this exists because you're dealing with it all the time. There are layers and layers of these local policies. All law, make no mistake, it is all law. All right, fantastic. Now let me get to my last little slide. Okay, on top of that, there's a whole layer of the judiciary. So sometimes law doesn't work and we don't know what to do with a given line of code given to a relative situation. There's a new application of law or there's some question of how to apply the law or we need to provide due process of law on any given instance. We use the court system to do a single thing in the United States, just one. It's there to resolve disputes. It's there to figure out what to do when we don't know what to do. That's what it's there. That's the whole point of it. And then we have courthouses in every single county in the entire United States whose job it is is to figure out locally on any given event that happens what to do when we don't know what to do. That's it. That's their job. And you can see sometimes that gets really, really big. Right now, we're dealing with the issue of gay marriage. You might have heard the US Supreme Court has taken the issue of gay marriage up and we'll have a ruling on the issue of gay marriage here in the next, uh, probably about July, if you're playing along at home and you wanna know when it's gonna hit, it's probably gonna hit in late June, almost July. They'll issue their opinion. And we'll have a ruling on what to do when we didn't know what to do right? Because some states say this on gay marriage and some states say that on gay marriage. And so the whole country is divided on this issue. We don't know what to do. So we're going to let the Supreme Court tell us what to do. That's it. That's what it's there for. All of this sits on top of you, dear teachers, dear administrators, dear whatever role you happen to be in, distance education person. It all sits on top of you. <laughs> Sorry. All of this operating system is functioning at any given moment inside of your classroom or your office or the server room that you work in, if you happen to be Michael. I don't know if you work in the server room or not, Mike, but yes, you do. There you go, awesome. So it's all sitting on top of you at any given moment. That's not a surprise. We all sort of know that, but no one really ever stops to think about it. That said, all of that law, and I'm telling you, there are thousands and millions of pages of law operating on top of you at any given moment. Just like your operating system, you, no one ever stops to think about the millions of lines of code that are functioning at any given moment to make that computer work in front of you. In the same way, there are millions of lines of code functioning at any given moment to make society work around you. That you're in this education in this class, EDL 665, at the University of Kentucky, inside the state of Kentucky, all of that, there are millions of lines of code making this class happen that you're in right now. No one ever stops to think about it. All that said, put yourself in the shoes of random kid. Let's see if, oh, sorry, I don't know if I can draw a box around random kid here. Let me, let me get a pointer. No, I cannot. Let's just say you're this little girl right here. You're high school, she looks more maybe like a high school junior. I don't know, something like that. 
to that high school junior, to that kid right there, and I got to put up a picture of myself on this slide, don't I? That's what I need to do. One of my kids, so I can say, that's Tiffany. To Tiffany, the most important lawmaker is the teacher. You know, to the person who's inside the system, to the kid that's living inside the education system at any given moment, or to the, to the, to the adult that's come back to school at BCTC who's trying to take classes, to that person, the most important lawmaker is the person they're interacting with at that moment. Because all those millions of lines of code that are underlying the system, all those pale in comparison to the millions of decisions that get made by the classroom teacher or by the server administrator or by the distance, learn, distance education operator. You all are making decisions all the time. It's just it's part of your jobs. It's perfect, it's what we want you to do, but you're making legal decisions all the time. You don't think about them that way, it's fine. You don't need to, I don't even want you to. Only for tonight, or if you're watching this on a recorded video, only for this moment. I want you to really think about you, yourselves as lawmakers. But if you're working at a public institution, that's absolutely what you're doing. You are a lawmaker. If you work in a public school in the state of Kentucky or uh, the state of Virginia, if you work for a public university, like the two higher educators in the room with us tonight do, you are an employee of the state, ultimately. Like who has your pension? The state of Kentucky does. They're the ones that help provide health care for you. All right, these things live that way because ultimately you're an employee of the state of Kentucky and you are a lawmaker inside the state of Kentucky. When it comes to that kid and you ask that kid who makes the rules, who are they going to say? They're going to say that teacher or the server administrator or the distance ed operator. That's who makes the rules. We use that term super loosely, but to that kid's perspective, you are the primary lawmaker. All right, fine. It's within all of that context, within all of that context, that we will ask our questions in this course. All right, that is how we're going to approach the questions of policy and technology and education and equity and ethics. All of those live within this really complex and deep operating system that we have here in society. So that is law and tech and schools. What is all that equal to in our little equation? That's you. That's your job, school technology leaders. <laughs> You're the one that makes this decision. Sounds crazy, but that's what we'll spend our time in class really diving deeply into, okay? Questions? <laughs> You're just freaked out at this moment, right? And it's, oh my God. You did myself. You're like, oh my gosh, what have I gotten myself into? Let me out. This is a disaster. <laughs> this guy, he's crazy. <laughs> true, all true. I went to law school to learn the rules. You know, like that's what I thought I was doing. I was a public school teacher first. I was a high school teacher. And uh, my wife convinced me to go to law school, sort of, because she didn't think I was making enough as a high school teacher, which is totally legit. Um, anyway, so I went to law school. So I did the opposite of being a teacher, right? I'm like, well, let's go make a lot of money. <laughs> anyway, along the way, though, I was interested in knowing the rules of the game. That's what I wanted to know. I thought it took me a long time to realize, though, that I was, as a teacher, the primary rule maker already. You don't think about it that way, but it is that way. And so we're going to spend this class sort of understanding that role that we have, uh, understanding how we influence the system, can positively influence the system, and really understanding the challenge that we have because technology is moving quickly right now. I mean, it is big time changes happening in society, like copyright. There's things happening like all kids are criminals. It's disastrously bad in some areas. And we have to fix it. Democracies depend on the people to do the work. You know, the, the democracy only works if we actually contribute. So it's our job to fix it. 
we at UKSTL think that we're hopefully training up some of the best people in the world to do that job. So we're going to try and get good at it here in 665. So that's pretty much it. Ashley, you jumped in at just the end of class. We're absolutely, we're done. The whole thing's recorded though. I've given this great speech. <laughs> For all, I'm going to retire after today. I'm going to be like, that's the best I can do. I'm done. <laughs> so, all right. We'll meet again in two weeks on a Tuesday. I'll send some instructions via email in between that time. Uh, one of those instructions, though, is to complete that little get to know you PowerPoint slide of what you actually do and what people think you do and what your mom thinks you do, all of that. So that's an actual task between now and then. We'll also have some readings. I've got a few more links to some Lawrence Lessig posts on Canvas, that, uh, a couple more videos of some great stuff that he's the best. He's the best. I love him. It's one of my top 10 heroes in the planet. So uh, I want to introduce you to Mr. Lessig a bit more, and then we'll meet up next time and we'll, we'll get to work. Cool? All right, I'll hang out in the room if anyone wants to chat after class. Otherwise, see you in a couple weeks. Bye-bye, everyone. How did it, oh, if you're still there, Ashley, how was class? The other one. Um, it, it was good. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, but I wanted to, I wanted to let you know because a couple other people had posted that they were getting off of your class and getting onto that. And I think Trisha got really confused and was thinking that we were having two classes on one night and kind of oh, got a little bit worked up over. And I told her, no, 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 you were totally you you knew that we were on Tuesdays and that you knew we were going to be in her class tonight. So just FYI. Yeah. So very good. I'm